How's it going guys? In today's video we're going to talk about the Ridgetail Monitor and their care. So the Ridgetail Monitor, known as Varanus acanthurus, is a arid species of Australian monitor. They're also a dwarf monitor. They don't get much bigger than about 45 centimeters or so. My very happy little green tree frog wants to join in, I guess, making all that noise. Um, so as I was saying, these guys only get around 60 to 45 centimeters in length. That's including their tail length as well. Uh, so they're not a very large monitor species. So ridgetails are found throughout Northwestern Australia. They're found in the Northern Territory as well as Northwest Queensland. And as I was saying, they are an arid species. So they're mainly found in arid, rocky kind of areas. Um, they live in very rocky outcrops. And that is part of, I guess, why they're also known as uh, spiny-tailed monitors, because if you look at their tail, it's quite thick and quite spiny for their size. And the reason for that is, like I was saying before, they live in rocky outcrops. Part of their defense mechanism is they'll wedge themselves into a really tight little crevice in the rocks, and then they'll use this tail to kind of barricade themselves in. And so when a predator tries to get them out of that rocky crevice, they just get a mouthful or a face full of this spiky tail blocking the entrance. Now being a monitor, they are of course strictly carnivorous. So their diet is mainly insects and small animals. So in the wild, they'll be eating anything from a variety of, I guess, arid species of insects, various types of grasshoppers and crickets mainly, as well as other small reptiles and snakes if they can catch them. So these will happily eat smaller lizard species and um, small snakes but the bulk of their diet will consist of insects. Ridgetails can live on average around 10 to 15 years. So they're a reasonably long-term pet should you want one of these. So if you're looking to dip your toes into the water monitors, I would highly recommend the Ridgetail Monitor. They're just a nice species. I mean, they're fairly well tempered. They don't get too big, like I was saying, around 45 or so centimeters. And their care and husbandry isn't that over the top for a monitor, and they're just a pretty bulletproof animal all around. So when we're talking about enclosures, usually when you hear the word monitor lizard, you think big, so you think big enclosure. Most people that keep larger species of monitor, like for example, lace monitors, even like Spencer's monitors, I guess are sort of big. You're looking at like kind of dedicating a whole room to that monitor. They're gonna need a fairly large space to roam around as monitors are a fairly high metabolism, so they're very high activity sort of animal. They're moving around and climbing and digging quite a lot. They're also one of the more intelligent species of lizard out there. So they need a lot more mental stimulation to keep them happy and healthy and kind of satisfied with their setup, opposed to something like a bearded dragon. So for a Ridgetail, while they're not massive and they don't need a whole room dedicated to them, you still want to give them a reasonable amount of space because they are relatively active and they still need that mental stimulation because they are on that next tier of, I guess, intelligence as far as reptiles go. I would say minimum is a 4x2x2 by two by two for a Ridgetail monitor. If you can go bigger, go for it. They're a very active lizard, they'll definitely use that space. Ridgetails like things warm, as I said, they are an arid species. So regarding their basking spot, with the temperature gradient regarding their cooler spot, you want the basking spot to be around 38 degrees Celsius, with the cooler end of the enclosure going down to around 28 degrees Celsius. You want to achieve this by either a heat lamp or a ceramic heat emitter. Make sure it is hooked up to a thermostat though, just in case you don't want to accidentally overheat your lizard. These guys do like it hot, but you still want to have a thermostat just in case it gets too hot. Provide them with a UVB light too. 10.0 UVB spectrum for these, and you can achieve that either via a T8 or a T5 UVB tube, or a UVB coil. However, if you're gonna go the coils, you might need multiples as, like I said, they're in a reasonable size enclosure. So to get a decent coverage of UVB for these guys, you would probably need at least two or three coils spread along the length of your enclosure. So saying that, it's probably just more efficient to go with a tube over a coil. Replace that UVB bulb every six to eight months, depending on the brand of UVB bulb, but generally every six to eight months, they do need replacing. Now with decorating this enclosure, like I was saying, these are an arid species. They like rocky outcrops. They like flat crevices they can wedge themselves into as well as hollows and caves. So there's a few ways you can go about it. You can make something out of like expanding foam as like a background sort of thing for the enclosure or you can buy pre-made kind of rocky ledge type backgrounds. Either is fine, they'll quite happily climb on those. So lots of rocky ledges for them to sit on is great. 
also regarding their basking spot, you want to use something that holds onto temperature quite well so they can sit on like a rock that also heats up from the heat lamp and bask. What a lot of people do, they'll actually use tiles of slate or the roofing tiles. Um, they all hold heat quite well. A lot of people will just kind of lean a bunch of roofing tiles against each other. Um, because roofing tiles aren't fully flat, they have a bit of a curve to them. Um, so the lizard can kind of get under them as well as on top. Or like I say, slate tiles, you can lean them against other rocks to create some like kind of hidey holes there. And that flat surface from the slate is just a nice kind of surface area that heats up for your lizard. That being said, you don't necessarily have to go down that road. That's just kind of what they do seem to prefer. You can also buy like the uh, fake rock looking inserts for your enclosure, like Universal Rock makes a lot of nice fake rock sort of structures for reptile tanks. They're quite nice too. And your Ridgetail will quite happily use those. You can also give them some hollow logs to hide in or some caves, kind of like, a, or even just snake hides. Either is fine, because these guys will like to kind of get out of sight when they want to go to sleep at night time. Mine will always kind of go underneath um, his little rock structure to hide. I use a universal rock kind of corner piece in my tank and he, go, he digs under there and he's kind of hollowed out the hole underneath of that and he'll just go under there and sleep every night. So they do like to get kind of hidden away when they want to go to sleep. Now, regarding their water bowl, it doesn't have to be as big as, say, a water bowl for a snake might be, because you'll often hear me say when I'm doing, I guess, care videos about various um, species of snakes, give them a big water bowl so they can fully soak. Uh, with these guys being an arid species, they're not really big on soaking in water. Um, they do drink, though, quite a bit, considering they're arid. Uh, so just give them a water bowl that's definitely big enough to allow them to drink and allow them to actually find the water bowl. Don't give them a water bowl so tiny that they don't even notice it. Give them something probably big enough that they could soak in if they wanted to, but they more or less won't. And you want to change that water regularly, especially with these guys because they do like to dig a lot. And my one especially will almost always ruin his water within about a day or two. He just kicks up the substrate into the water and within a day or two, it's a water bowl that's basically 90% substrate with no water. He just kind of fills it up every time with substrate. So you don't want to be changing the water regularly, but every time I change it, he does come down for a drink. So they do appreciate nice clean water. And as I just mentioned it, substrate. Now, like I said, they like to dig. So you want to go a deep layer of substrate. Firstly, there's a few types you can use. You can use either the fine desert sand, you can use coconut core or coconut fiber. You can do a mix of coconut core and sand, but you wanna have a deep layer because they do dig. So you wanna go minimum 10 centimeters deep, go a bit more if you can. If you don't wanna have your whole enclosure that deep with substrate, what a lot of people do, they'll kind of section off maybe half of their enclosure and have all the deeper sand on that end and have a shallow end at the other end or something. Or you can give them like a big tub of sand. You can just put a large tub, like just a plastic storage tub in their enclosure and fill that with coconut core or sand or whatever and that can be the pit for them to dig in. Otherwise, if you're not fussed about that so much, just make the whole enclosure that deep layer because they will kind of dig little burrows and make little cavities out and stuff like that. And it's just good enrichment for them. Now, like I was saying, these guys are insectivores. So when it comes to feeding, you're gonna have to feed them live food. If this is something that you're not overly comfortable with, maybe a Ridgetail Monster is not the pet for you because these will need live feeder insects 90% of the time. That's gonna be the bulk of their diet. You wanna give them a variant though. So you can go crickets, you can go wood roaches, Millworms, superworms. For you guys that watch me in the US, I know you guys can get duvet roaches as well. We can't have them here, unfortunately, but they're a great option. Same as you guys in the US go, uh, here, you can get waxworms. I'm sure they'll quite happily take those, but they're not something available in Australia. So yes, you wanna have a varied diet of live feeder insects. And occasionally you can give them maybe like a frozen thawed pinky mouse as a treat. However, pinkies are kind of high in fat content. So you don't wanna make that the bulk of their diet. That's just a little treat for them every now and again. Because in the wild, occasionally they will feed on small, like mammals of some sort or another that they can catch. Maybe like whatever arid species of rodent lives where they live. They might raid rodent nests and eat the babies. Um, so they're gonna occasionally eat that sort of thing in the wild. So a pinky mouse as a treat is good, but the bulk of their diet should be live feeder insects. And you wanna mix them up a bit so there's some variation. Be sure to dust their food with a calcium vitamin supplement as well. Um, and other than that, you just want to make sure not to overfeed them in general. 
They are a fast metabolism animal. They're going to eat pretty much all the time. If you offer them food, they almost always take it. I would only feed them maybe every two to every three days though. Give them a day or two break between feeding as overfeeding can lead to things like obesity and possibly fatty liver disease, especially if they're getting too much of the fatty stuff like the frozen thawed pinkies. And lastly is handling and temperament. So these guys generally are a great lizard for handling. However, they're a bit more, I guess, active than say handling a bearded dragon. My one for the video, he is actually surprisingly behaving quite well. He's just sitting there. And this is purely because prior to making this video, I had to wake him up and take him out of his little hidey hole to film. So he's probably still a bit groggy and out of it because he's half asleep and he's not fully warmed up yet. Normally when he's at full kind of temperature and he's been active for a portion of the day and he's woken up fully, he is very active. He's not at all flighty, but he's just, um, I don't know. I kind of always tell people that handling a, a Ridgetail Monitor is kind of like handling a ferret. They're climbing up your arm, they're going up your shoulder, down your t-shirt, out your sleeve, on top of your head, down the back of your shirt. They're very, very inquisitive and curious and they're never content sitting still for very long. So they're not something you can, I guess, sit on your lap and watch TV with, like again, a bearded dragon. They're gonna wander around and poke their heads into all sorts of little crevices and holes and disappear if you ignore them for too long. But if you want something that you can handle and you're happy to just interact with and keep a close eye on it and don't put it down and ignore it because it'll disappear, these are a fantastic handling type of a lizard. The only thing I mentioned guys is just with, again with the feeding, use feeding tongs or give them their food in a bowl. Don't hand feed monitors. While they are little, they're still a monitor and monitors all have incredibly sharp serrated teeth. Even a little fella like this does hurt when he bites you, he will draw some blood. And regarding food, their feeding response is incredibly aggressive and they will bite your finger by accident if you're hand feeding them. So just use those tongs when feeding them. Right here guys, well that's my video on the Ridgetail Monitor. I hope you've enjoyed, I hope it's clarified some things. If any of you are considering one of these amazing lizards as a first time monitor. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And buy me a coffee, the link's down in the description. If you wanna donate to the channel, that'd be the best way to do it. But until then, I'll see you in the next one. See you guys.